and welcome to another episode of Ask a Pianist. My name is Andrew Ahrens, and today we'll be looking at fugues. Specifically, when to play out the fugal theme or subject, and when we might want to consider doing something different. When pianists approach fugues, there is a rather insidious performance tradition that involves training to play the fugal theme louder than the surrounding counterpoint at all costs, all the time. There are reasons behind this, of course, both pedagogical and technical, but in terms of performance and interpretation, this tactic actually goes against the musical text in terms of texture and counterpoint distribution. On the one hand, it's a great skill to have to be able to bring out the fugal theme in any voice anytime it appears, but on the other hand, it's a dead end in terms of musical interpretation and remarkably boring to listen to. And this approach causes us to miss so many beautiful juxtapositions brought into the music by the composers. So, the question for this episode is, do I always have to bring out the theme in the fugue, or can I do something different? Let's consider a beautiful, though typical, fugue of Bach. This happens to be part of a double fugue, but we'll just deal with the first part of it for now. For the moment, I'll play it in a traditional manner. Every time the fugue theme appears, I'll highlight it for the listener. section introduces the fugal theme or subject, and it appears in all the voices sequentially. First, alone in the soprano voice, openings, we have 
specific isolation of each entry of the subject. It is always played in the lowest voice, and therefore our ears can easily find it. Not only that, but the counterpoint that is played with the theme is reasonably transparent and not intrusive. So one could argue that the emphasis should be on the theme due to the compositional texture. In the entry of the second or alto voice, for example, the upper counterpoint gets out of the way of the notes of the fugue theme, both rhythmically and texturally. Again, when the final fugue entry is playing, the top two voices actually disappear a little later on to avoid a texture that would be too thick for the bass subject to be heard easily. This is not by chance, this is by design. Bach wants us to hear certain elements, and he writes his music so that it happens automatically, even if we play each voice with the same dynamic or sound quality. So far, the idea of bringing out the fugue theme seems to make sense. Although it's not acoustically necessary, it's a nice way of signaling to the audience a few things. First, that I, as a pianist, am aware of the importance of this theme. Second, that I am capable of playing it beautifully in any voice or register of the instrument. And third, that I'm giving the audience several chances to hear and memorize this theme so that when it comes back in other forms, the audience will be able to recognize it without me having to blast it out at them. Remember, a fugue is not a passacaglia. We don't have a ground bass that is always there. Fugues also have development sections where the fugue theme may not exist for quite a while, so it's actually very important that the fugue theme, when announced at the beginning of the piece, is clearly stated and structured. Once we have established the fugal theme, Bach begins to set up more complex situations than he had before. He has a little transition area after the first statements of the fugue theme where he removes the theme entirely and lets the counterpoint subjects modulate to a few keys for a while. actually doing is showcasing the counterpoint and making it slightly more complex in terms of gesture or chromaticism. What this means is that when the fugal theme arrives again, the counterpoint is more interesting to listen to than before, and furthermore, the counterpoint is now constructed to interfere more with the fugue than it was in the earliest statements of it. Let's compare two instances, both with a total of three voices, and both constructed to have the fugue theme in the bass line. First, we have the early opening statement for the tenor voice subject, and listen carefully to how the upper counterpoint gets out of the way of the theme when I play it. Now, the second instance has the same number of voices and the same distribution with the fugue in the bass, but the counterpoint subtly invades the register of the fugue theme, increasing the thickness of the texture and resulting in the appearance of another fugue theme early as the bass theme is finishing. This is the point where I begin to happily disagree with the general performance practice of fugues on the piano. When the counterpoint increases in complexity, we actually have to abandon the fugue theme in favor of the new material. Why must we do this? There are a couple of reasons. First, the audience by now is quite familiar with the fugal theme, though it may transfer to a different key or register, or even start early or late rhythmically. The theme itself and how it is structured remains the same. So, really, to continually point it out to the audience by playing it louder than everything else is redundant once you've exited the exposition where the fugue is stated in each voice. In other words, 
To emphasize the fugue theme in the middle of a fugue is to point out something that hasn't changed, and this is, in terms of musical drama and development, simply boring and uninteresting. Second, when we abandon the fugue theme in favor of the more complex new material, we're actually encouraging our audience to listen to how amazing the composer really is. After all, it is quite a challenge to create new counterpoints to an old theme, and to have that musical material interweave with the fugue in a way that balances how we listen to the music, as well as what the music says to us. The importance in a fugue is not the fugue theme, but how the theme interacts with the counterpoint. In order for this to be heard, we have to stop emphasizing the fugue theme over everything else. Simple. Now, how do we decide what voices to bring out, and when? Furthermore, do we abandon the fugue theme forever, or do we still bring it out once in a while at a strategic moment? Let's look at it from an unpianistic viewpoint for a moment. In terms of instruments, both the organ and the harpsichord do not have the capability of differentiating voices within the same keyboard. And though the clavichord has this ability, its use as a performance instrument did not come to a full flourishing until larger, more resonant instruments were built. Therefore, I think it's very important to consider what kinds of voicing we'd get if we played this fugue on an instrument that doesn't have tonal differentiation within a single keyboard. Now, I don't have a harpsichord with me at the moment, so I'll play the opening of the fugue with as little differentiation between voices as possible, both in terms of dynamics and sound quality. Essentially, I'll play it neutral and even. subject appears quite clearly in all voices, without the need for reinforcement of a dynamic or sound quality choice. Now, let's continue and see what happens. three more times. Once in the bass, here, once in the middle register, here, top register as a final statement.
If played neutrally, both the bass and the soprano themes sound quite clearly, whereas the one in the middle register almost disappears, or at least is superseded by the other material from a sonic point of view. There are lots of interesting things happening here. First, the entrance of the theme appears early, while the exit of the bass theme is still being played. To make matters more complex, Bach has a trill running while the opening of the new theme occurs, which, in terms of sheer sound, actually serves to hide or obscure this opening. If I played it without the trill, it would be a lot easier to hear the new theme. These issues all serve to tell us one thing. Bach wants to hide this theme, to make it seem like it came out of nowhere. Second, as the theme continues, it blends in rhythmically with the bass voice. And it also blends in with the top voice. continues the idea of hiding this theme, or forcing it into the background in favor of other voices. It's very important for us to realize this compositional intention. If we play it neutrally, the fugue theme becomes something which essentially serves as a linchpin to the other counterpoint material, and its existence in the background allows us to explore the counterpoint without feeling like we've lost our way musically. Here's what I mean. If I play this section neutrally, we get this. If I play it with emphasis on the shapes, gestures, and contours of the counterpoint while ignoring the fugue, then we get something surprisingly interesting. Sadly, we lose all this interest if we blast out the fugue subject like this. Instead of an interesting section, we just have another statement of the fugue. That's just not good enough. At this point, I should say that it's extraordinarily important in fugue study to have the ability to bring out single voices at any time. That is one of the reasons why playing a fugue on the piano normally constitutes playing the fugue theme out whenever it appears. There's no excuse for not being able to do this, and I'm not advocating abandoning the fugue theme solely to make a fugue easier to play. Quite the contrary. No matter what you do, your voices must be made separate from an auditory point of view, and you can use different sound qualities or articulations in order to accomplish this. But having the ability to play a fugue theme out in any voice is merely the beginning of this kind of technical focus, not the end. Once you are comfortable with this skill, then it is necessary to take your interpretation to a higher level of thought and expression. The only way to do this is to consider what the counterpoint is doing and how Bach weaves all these voices together. This is what I'm advocating. Now, I'm going to play the first fugue again, this time making adjustments to the voicing so that the fugue theme is not necessarily the focus at every appearance. The piece begins with the four statements of the fugue theme in each voice, and then the fugue develops, with other counterpoints taking precedence. Then, at the end of the fugue, the theme appears again in a prominent place, to end with a final cadence.
As with all my episodes, I think it's important to state that I do not believe that a piece can be played only one way. There's an almost infinite variety of interpretations musicians can come up with, which is not only a testament to the imagination of pianists, but also to the intellect of the composers. But that being said, I have always had concern over pianistic traditions that are never questioned, and in this particular case, fugal domination is not only not questioned, it's actually seen as something of a necessity or a given, and to do otherwise seems somewhat sacrilegious. I counter this possibility by asking the question, if we have the capability of differentiating voices on the piano, why would we waste this opportunity by always focusing on the fugue theme alone? I'll say it once more. The focus of a fugue is not the fugue theme itself, but how this theme develops and interacts with the counterpoint. So, until next time, keep practicing, and don't ignore your counterpoint. Bye for now.